first of all, thanks for everybody for coming to listen to what I've, what I've got to say. Um, my name's John Parkinson, and I am co-founder and managing director of a company called Inuio. Uh, but our um, involvement goes back, our family involvement, quite a bit longer. And in fact, the shoddy and mungo trade goes back about 200 years. So in around 45 or 50 minutes, I'm going to cover as much as I can in terms of the shoddy trade and some of the stories and uh, through our involvement and, um, uh, and, and where we are now, and where the shoddy trade is now. And um, I'll leave some space if um, perhaps I can get a nod with 10 minutes to go, uh, Emma, and I'll leave some space then for questions because there could well be people here um, that um, have had their own experiences that we can share. And, uh, and of course, the, 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 the textile recycling trade was a very broad range of things. It weren't just the shoddy and mungo trade that I, um, I, I kind of was trained in or found myself in um, in 1970 or before then, actually. But the story starts a lot sooner. The story starts, according to the historians, with a guy called Benjamin, Benjamin Law, that on Bartholomew's day, about 1807-ish, um, he goes down with his two partners to a, a cloth fair. So it's Batley is a cottage industry making cloth. He's a clothier. And he goes down there and he goes down with his partners. I think one was a Newsom. Joseph Newsom used to be on Bradford Road, where Red Brick Mill is now. Um, and another was an agent, a cloth agent in London. So they were there as a, three of them all partners together. And he always called in this saddler's shop. And he called in this day and he saw sticking out of a saddle, he saw some, some fiber. And like we all do, he sat twiddling it around and pulling it to see what it's like. And he asked his friend, the saddler, who he always called in to see, how, how, how much is this? Oh, it's just, it's just shredded up stuff. It's not much. It's, he perhaps wouldn't say 10 bob and a Jaffa cake by, in those days, but that's what we'd have said. And uh, so, okay, well, can you get a bale delivered? And he had a bale delivered in secret because he'd, got this, he'd already got this spark of an idea. But he didn't share this with his partners. He decided to keep it, as, as we'd say around here, he decided to keep it to his say. And he, and he, he came up and he, and he worked with this material um, for months and months. I do, I've heard tell that he sent some of it to Brig House to get pulled because clearly pulled, shredded. Uh, clearly, some of this were already happening because it was being used for stuffing. And in Brig House, some machinery was there that did this. And he tried and tried until eventually, historians reckon around 1813, he perfected the, uh, uh, the ability to use reclaimed wool in, with new wool and make a decent, well, first piece of cloth wasn't all that decent because he had to hawk it around Dalton District and eventually ended up selling it in Barnsley of all places, which funnily enough is where I live now. Not where I started off, I started off in Chicken. Um, so, he'd got to start. He'd got something that somebody else hadn't got, but he was still doing it in secret. It was really, diff really difficult to keep it from anybody. And even when he let his brother-in-law, Benjamin Parr, into his secret and to help him, he used to send Benjamin Parr up to Scotland to collect rags. So nobody had noticed what was happening. And uh, Benjamin Parr used to go away, and especially because he was a quite an outspoken man, as, as the historians say. And he'd go up to Scotland and fetch these rags down in secret, and they'd try and work with them. But some of these rags were knitted, some of them were woven, which is the difference between shoddy and mungo. So fibres recovered from knitted garments like this. This is out of rags, by the way, which we would put through machine. And mungo are fibres recovered from woven garments that could be worsted or woolen spun. And it used to be set up in Morley. If it's got two ends, they can spin it. And they were called Morley trade, that the mungo trade. And the rumour is that how did Mungo get its name? There's a, there's a, on the wall over there, there's an idea that Shoddy might have come from 
to shed. It might have come from America as, as things went backwards and forwards, interestingly, to America um, with various people from this district. George Archer, one of the guys from Osset, who uh, helped Benjamin Law um, to develop his rag tearing machine, actually went to America and developed quite a, they call it picking, not pulling, or down the eastern coast of America. So there are connections there. But the Mungo thing, um, it's reputed that when Benjamin Parr couldn't get it to spin, because it's much shorter, because it's from woven and tightly, you have to be more aggressive to get the fibre out. It probably wasn't as long as, a, as, the, as the loose, longer staple that we're going to knit it. He was, he, they said, you'll, you'll not make it spin, Benjamin. You'll not make it go. And he said, it won't go, which of course, mon must. And that's where some people, uh, I've got an alternative explanation, given that he was sending him to Scotland to buy rags. I would have thought that he'd gone to where it was densely populated. So Edinburgh and Glasgow, just so happens that the oldest cathedral in Glasgow is the Cathedral of St. Mungo. So it's not too far to stretch, stretch your point. So all this were going off in secret. And as Benjamin Law got um, uh, even better at what he was doing, he decided that he, he'd keep it secret, but he wanted to sell more money. He was going to send his son John to America with this sh shipment of cloth that he made. And his son went, John, and came back family hero, although keeping it quiet, made a handsome profit. So Benjamin wanted to maximize the opportunity, said, I'm going to send you back to America this time, not with half a shipload, but with a full shipload. And off he went to America, um, but he told, he told his friends that he didn't want to go to America. He didn't want to go back. And if his father insisted that he'd go back, then he'd not return. And we're not sure why. And the whole thing is, was it a girl that he met in America the last time they were there? Is it a girl who didn't want to leave him badly? We don't know why. But when he didn't return, Benjamin got on a boat his early 1800s, went to New York. And the people there, when he started asking around, said, well, what are you man here? here? And he had a bit of a strange accent like yours. And he had a lot of cash. And he's going down to New Orleans for a good time. But it turned out that yellow fever were raging in New Orleans. Benjamin never followed him. Came home a broken man. Well, he must have been, because he went to live over at Pennines in, uh, in Lancashire. And um, never really were given any recognition for what he started until his sister put um, in Battle Church, put a headstone, still there. And also then a bit later on, outside Battle Library, there's a, a blue plaque um, dedicated to Benjamin Law. And Benjamin Law, his, his discovery um, launched uh, an amazing uh, sort of flourishing of small towns and hamlets, Osset, Batley, Dewsbury, all down the Combe Valley and other fields, into Bradford and Leeds in parts, where shoddy manufacturing um, started to sort of lead the world in wool, wool cloth that were a bit cheaper. Um, and that one of the ironies being as well, that when, he, when, when Benjamin Law um, came back from America, the people that he'd hidden his secret from had discovered his secret and they were already onto him. And eventually, very quickly, um, they built the first um, mill dedicated to just making shoddy cloth, which if you go to um, it lane traffic lights, it used to be Batley Barless, I don't know what it is. And there's, it's like an iron shaped building. That's the office block of the first ever UK shoddy mill that were made just for making shoddy cloth. And behind it was mill, but mill burnt down. So they built this fireproof mill, that burnt down. They built another and it still burnt down. So uh, there's nothing there, I think they're redeveloping it now. But yeah, that, that's kind of all, all here. And um, the, the, the industry, the woolen industry, because of the shoddy trade, flourished and the cloth was sold because the, 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 the skills and the techniques and the machinery were only here at that time. Uh, uh, sort of more widespread now, but they were only they were only here. So the Kirklees area flourished, making this stuff. At that, in those days, it weren't the um, charities, as it is now, that are collecting materials. The charities weren't really involved. There were rag merchants that were collecting. And Tatters, Tatters is an old name for a rag and bone man. 
So, you, you know, I have to remember them going around the streets and bone and all that kind of stuff. And people had, had given give the stuff to the tatters for whatever it was, a, a farthing or a goldfish or whatever. Some would take them straight to what they call marine stores, which is just like a scrap yard, really, a marine store. But they'd take clothes in as well. And then the rag merchants would buy them and sort them into um, a range of colours. So there are some specialised in stockings and balloons. That's the knitted stuff. Never knew why they called them stockings and balloons and still don't. But stockings are uh, really coarse ones or Shetland and coarser. Balloons are uh, from a fine lamb's wool and finer like merino. So they, they, could, they could be sorted into different qualities. They weren't always by the rag merchants. Certainly the shoddy manufacturers would. We did. And they'd sort them into about 50 standard shades from white to black and all the different blues and pastel blues and all that kind of stuff. They should have taken buttons and labels off, but they were never very good at doing that. They'd take some off and uh, we'd have to take rest and uh, sometimes uh, the buttons would get crushed in the machine and they'd just drop down with gravity. Uh, it's not the way we do it now, but it's the way that uh, was done then. And they would, there were rag merchants on, one of Osset's claims is that there were a rag merchant on every street corner in Osset, whether it were true or not, um, but their town motto in, uh, I can't pronounce it in Latin, but converted to English is useless things, useless things by art made useful, which is fabulous because that's just what the shoddy and mongo trade did. And still does, only just though. So there are all this sort of flourishing of, of activity and, and um, during the Industrial Revolution, and especially when it was wartime. Because they, they used to, um, buy, when they couldn't get the wool over and they needed to make cheap uniforms for uh, the forces, it was the shoddy trade that, 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 um, that they turned to. In fact, when they, they say when the cannons, when the cannons, cannons roared, the mill chimneys boomed or some similar thing like that. And that's just what it was. And even though it's, a, it's able, able to do it cleaner now, of course, that I mean, days when the chimneys would smoke. And the old joke was that birds in battle used to fly backwards so they didn't get soot in their eyes. All that kind of stuff. But so you can do things a lot cleaner now. Uh, but it certainly, it had the reputation of being dangerous. The machine, the rag machine was called the devil. Because it's, it's a big cylinder with teeth on that spun around really fast. Health and safety won't what it was like today. There won't be guards on stuff. And many people had accidents and lost fingers and lost hands and stuff like that. So. The old shoddy trade, even though today it's got a real relevance, back in the day had a kind of, the, the name shoddy is like detrimental. And even has connotations with um, some of the materials, I've noticed some information uh, over there that, 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 that relate to the uh, colonial past and all that kind of stuff where cheap blankets were made. In fact, cheap blankets were still made here in, in Kirklees, really up to, up to, 80s, uh, when mills used to, when, when the government would fill warehouses full of blankets in case of a disaster. And so if there were an earthquake, there were piles and piles. So when the mills were quiet, that's when they used to order this stuff. And it was all the mixed colored uh, material that was just gray, but was, a, was a, a warm. And, and, and there were places down the Cone Valley and here as well that were blanket manufacturers. Uh, and manufacturing blankets and heavy woolens was a good thing for maximizing the amount of reclaimed content. Because it's recycled and often, if it hasn't been graded for different micron, that's thickness of fiber, then that limits how far it can be spun. Also the length of it limits how far it can be spun and also the damage done in the recycling process on its own. But you can blend it with new wool, which helps. You can grade the wool better. But as a generalization, uh, a reclaimed fiber yarn, wool yarn, couldn't be spun as fine as a new wool. Just depends on which wool and all that kind of stuff, but as a general rule. So blanket manufacturing and rugs and travel rugs and all that kind of stuff were great for shoddy trade and people what needed blankets. We didn't have polyester duvets. I haven't moved on yet beyond World War II uh, when they invented you know, polyesters and and nylons and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and people had wool blankets. People didn't necessarily have central heatings in their homes and all that kind of stuff. And fashions were different. People wore wool and wool caps alone. The, the cap trade were massive. 
as well as the apparel and knitwear and all that kind of stuff. So um, the 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 the, um, the the shoddy and mongrel trade <coughs> had an audience, had had people that needed what they were making in ways that isn't quite the same today. So let's go then up to World War Two. We've sort of gone fast forward. We've gone a long time, but everywhere's booming. There's always boom and bust, and there's always that kind of thing happening in the trade. Um, but generally speaking, once you get to the Second World War, that thing, that change of fashion, um, the synthetic fibres that come out, the amount of denim that becomes popular to wear, that people are gradually becoming more um, less formal in the clothing and all that kind of stuff. And it's around that time too when some of the mills start to shut and some of the machinery that was being used for both woolen spinning and for um, recycling were being exported. So in places like Parato near Florence in Italy, we're starting to learn about how to recycle and started to do it in their own way, mechanical recycling. And they were doing it because now, and this wouldn't have mattered then, but now people are experimenting with chemical recycling. And that's with like cotton and synthetics, where they're able to add chemicals to, to them, get them back into a sludge and re-extrude them as a fiber. So that's all going off with chemical recycling. But, and that's kind of the, the, the thing that captured a lot of excitement. And to some extent, mechanical recycling, the shoddy and mungo trade, has got forgotten. But in Prato, in Italy, they developed it. They have different techniques to the ones that we do and, uh, and did it really well as well. They did a fabulous job in other parts of the world some in Eastern Europe and particularly Panipat near Northern Delhi in India, they still make these, these blankets that used to be made here with lower grade stuff. Um, so it starts to get spread and of course we had a little bit happening down, down America as well. So it's, we start to see the contraction of the industry, um, both in the machinery and the way that things are being collected. The charities start to move in and um, uh, take over the, the, the sort of post-consumer waste collections, more of which they're interested in selling as a second-hand piece of clothing than for the shoddy trade, because that's diminishing and not as lucrative. Um, and also, because there were fewer mills and factories, the pre-consumer the pre waste wasn't as plentiful. So people who were knitting, the knitted panels, weaving, salvages from end of looms, all that kind of stuff wasn't quite as plentiful, but still, still tons. We're not talking about bags or we're talking about wagon loads, but it started to decline. And um, it was about that time <laughs> that my dad came out to RAF and joined the shoddy manufacturer's firm of all the jobs to go into in Ravensthorpe, I think, and he was a salesman. And my earliest memories were probably three, four, five year old. Things were different then, weren't they? just in cars, as he was going around mills, and he'd go into the mill, do his thing, and then he'd come out, and we'd go to the next one, and then we'd eventually we'd go to the mill that he worked for. Um, and uh, when I was 10, he bought his own on uh, Bradford Road, in between what used to be Joseph Newsom's Red Brick Mill, and where Joshua Ellis's used to be. They've now got flats, and that was Colin Parkinson Limited, a small shoddy manufacturing firm that he bought off Purdy's, if anybody's memory stretches back that far. I'm going to say, yeah, I don't know. We weren't, we were just on Bradford Road, just right on it, in fact, to, to front. They have indeed. Yeah, they have. Yeah, they're, uh, they're up there now. But where they used to be, we're nearly next door. <coughs> Eric Stotts as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So we started there in 1970 <coughs> and managed to hold on to as much trade as we could. But the firms were closing, did a bit of export. Got to sort of 1989, 1990, and we realised that there probably weren't going to be enough business here in the old shoddy and mongo trade. So me as a, a, a young upstart decided that um, perhaps we ought to do, some, do it a bit differently. And it just so happened that that time we lost my dad, he died quite young. And so I had a bit more saint business than I would, would otherwise have had. And we started to notice in supermarkets that you got recycled signs on cardboard and other stuff. 
It had never struck me that I was recycling. I went and shot it I ain't got a, I didn't. It was like, that's what, yeah, that's what we do. I'd never thought, thought about it. Um, and so we said, well, maybe we're missing a trick here. Maybe there's a, we, you know, we're, we might be all right at making shoddy, but we're missing a marketing trick. So I went out, spoke to lots of the mills and asked if they were interested because we just sold to them. We just bought in the waste, graded it a bit finer, put it through machines to a specific colour. Perhaps I'm not, I'm not doing as justice there. And to understand complexity, you had to make a, 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 a woolen spinner go to you, come to you with a piece of cloth or some threads, uh, sometimes a, a, a scoured pad, and they'd say, I want that colour, I want it to be in this composition, and we're going to spin it to whatever count, th thickness. Um, and we had to figure out a blend whereby, and they said, this will run round every year. So we had to figure out a blend where we could repaint the colour, the composition, it had spin to the count, it had, it had uh, be at the right price and so many other variables I could just go on. So it, it is quite a, quite a skill and a craft knowing how to put all these things together and how to be able to um, maintain conformity and, and keep producing that particular thing for that customer if that's what they want. Um, but um, the industry <clears throat> I got really small. Lots of the traditional things weren't uh, enough for us. And also, I think at that time, we were just before us time, and the mills couldn't understand why we'd... They'd say to me, John, we've been keeping it quiet for 200 years. What do you want to tell people about it for? There have been, you know, one had been going in, reclaimed one, and nobody said too much about that. We just, just, you know, so... The advantage as well wasn't that you're just reclaiming um, the fibre, you were reclaiming the colour as well, because you brought it into different colours. There's a great story up, I've got enough. There's a great story, and you know what they said, don't let truth get it, we have a good story. And there's a great story that I just have to tell you before I tell you about Evergreen, which is where I started. And it's a story about, um, you know, like if you go back to 1800s and you see military, and they're all in red, red coats, they used to call them red coats. Uh, on it, somebody figured out, well, we, we just like with targets on a green field. We just, and so the military, the MOG, even of that time, were trying to figure out how, how, what can we do about this. And so this person were going up to this mill in Huddersfield to have a look at um, ways of uh, what could they possibly do. And it just so happens, apparently, that there were a lightning bolt that night that struck the dye works. And dye pan were open, and all different dyes had gone into the Right. So instead of having a beautiful red, they got this, this, this melange that turned out to be called khaki, which in India I think is just dust or dirt. Um, and the guy that came, came up from the um, government happened to drop on somebody who uh, were a bit disgruntled with management in the firm. And they were laughing <coughs> about this thing that had all happened and all paint had gone. And he said, I won't be seen dead in that colour. Exactly. And that's, that's, that's a story that's in the books um, as to, to where khaki came around and why the uniforms changed. But yeah, we saw a different, a different opportunity. The mills weren't um, interested in, um, in, in sort of investing themselves, but we did work with some mills that were prepared to uh, spin our materials and um, mix it with wool and we, we wove stuff and we knitted stuff and um, went with a, a wide range of things. Eventually we put two of our own carding sets and a spinning frame in as well to, to, um, to get control of the production. And um, I'll leave, I'll, I'll not, there's some stuff there, but I'll leave some stuff out on the floor when I told you to take labels off, you know. Um, so this was evergreen, and this was some of the ranges of yarns we made. So these were recycled wool mostly, recycled wool acrylic. So there were loads of acrylic jumpers then. We thought we were doing a very good job recycling acrylic jumpers until we didn't realize that probably we were doing more harm than we were doing good because it releases microfibers into atmosphere. 
And whatever you do, at least we didn't have the atmospheric conditions in, in our old mills to control it. And they would have gone out somewhere and they do land on the ground and they do get washed into rivers and they do get into the seas. And whilst it's a terrible thing to have to fish plastic bottles out, you can't fish the microfibers out, the fish ingestion, da -da, we have the fish, if you eat fish, all that kind of stuff. So we, we uh, in our, in, for a new year, we are working with uh, synthetic fibers uh, right now because we haven't got the conditions to control it. These were recycled cashmeres. Here we're exper experimenting with recycled cotton and wool, which sometimes a bit tricky on the woolen system. The woolen system, by the way, is the only spinning system that you can uh, reclaim mechanically recycled wool. Um, other systems just are not uh, as forgiving. And here we've got hemp that we started to experiment with. So um, hemp is the fiber that is the basis for what people would know as the cannabis plant. But that's kind of more of a recent, well, say it's recent, it's probably ancient, but that's a strain that has a lot of THC in it and it can be used for recreational purposes. If you go back long enough to when the British Navy in the 1500s were like the, the thing, if you had so much acreage of land, you had to give it so much over to grow hemp that sales. It's one of the few fibres that's stronger when it's wet. So, um, I bet it grows without herbicides or pesticides. So it's a really useful um, fibre once you've got, once you can work with it. This one were recycled denim and were quite um, um, new at then. People do it now all the time. <clears throat> but we were quite new working with that. And one of the best things, and we, we Debenhams took it on, were recycling, recycling denim and also a firm in Bradford. I think they're called the Pennine Fibres. They're not going now, but they weren't at first people to be recycling from the plastic bottles. So polyethylene uh, triethylate, PET. Only certain plastic bottles can be granulated, melted down, re-extruded. But if it is that PET, it's the same stuff as a football shirt. Just exactly the same, can be extruded as a, as a fiber. Um, so we thought, well, that's recycled because we were still a bit, didn't, didn't realize that it wasn't all that good. Uh, but from a marketing point of view, we thought, all right then, plastic bottles. All right, they're not all Coca-Cola, but mm. denim, Levi's, two of the most marketable products in the world, blended together in a gorgeous jumper that goes with your jeans and fades down. Nice angle because it's cotton and polyester. So Debenhams were taking that. That was that was a really uh, um, uh, popular thing. Um, Tesco's were, did a line. We worked with the mail order catalogs of the. Charities like Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace, uh, World Wildlife Fund for Nature. Our best customer were Esprit, which are really big in America and uh, Far East, uh, not so much here. But I was, um, uh, they had a collection called E Collection. And in the early 90s, were really, really proactive. In fact, Linda Gross, the head designer, came to our mill when Jeff Banks came to our mill on Bradford Gross. And it was on Close Show. You can see that on our website, on YouTube thing. Jeff Banks were there. Uh, to do the program, and uh, they um, they came over to be part of that too. So um, we're doing lots of different types of recycling, working with lots of different materials, gaining some traction. But it was the the, the apart from it was still difficult to get enough business. We also had a fire at the time as well, which um, would, when you're recycling cotton, cellulosic. It's really can be really uh, you get lost, fine dust. You get a spark or a fire somewhere. And you get this spontaneous combustion thing going off, uh, and that's what happened one day. And so that caused a lot of damage. And eventually, uh, we realised that probably uh, we couldn't go any further, and so we had to close Evergreen in 1995. And um, we went off and made careers in uh, in other stuff, thinking, well, that's it. You know, and such a passion for us, a wonderful craft, but we're watching it sort of disappear in front of our eyes. Um, and uh, fast forward, if you like, three years ago, and my daughter, a swing tag, Ooh. she drew the flower. We had a swing tag uh, for, um, for Evergreen when she was seven. The same daughter then, three years ago, starts nudging me and saying, I've seen Stacey Dooley on telly, on the thing, saying that textiles is ruining the planet and nobody knows what to do about it. But you do, Dad, you can save world, guy. Oh, yeah, Jenny. 
And at first, I just took a bit of an interest and uh, I started to sort of just Google who might be left. And I, I couldn't like find anybody. But I'm picking up bits of history and thinking, well, I'd like to like tell the stories and because there's loads more stories, as you can imagine, uh, from the old days and all that kind of stuff. People following wagons around to see who was selling to who. And some wool manufacturers, woolen manufacturers were like ashamed that they were using shoddy because it's not like visiting a vintage shop today. It's like a, if we were hand-me-downs, it was like a bit of a, a shame thing. Um, so they'd have the bales delivered at the cover of darkness and, and they'd be marked up as something else. So nobody had all them sort of stories. Secrets and lies for 200 years, which is perhaps where we're changing things a little bit now. Um, and so, <clears throat> the more I looked, the more I could see that the skills, the knowledge, even the vocabulary, you know, the waste materials, chariots and balloons and balloons and stockings and surgeons, uh, and, and the machines, the, the, the parts on the machine, the swift and the bridge and the, uh, all this stuff. It's all going to go and it's been here all this time. And yet there seems to be a, a mismatch that there's, a, there's a, a, an interest in recycling, sustainability. And we've had it all and it's going at a time when, when uh, perhaps you know, we could do more with it. So it, what, partly, it was, partly it was fear of being in a rocking chair and thinking, I bottled it. I had all that knowledge and I was about, not that, I'm that good. I'm just last man standing, just about. That's all. The last traditional shoddy manufacturers, Charles, Charles Day, Envy Days, on Savile Bridge, closed in 2000. It was the last traditional one for, for respinning. And, you know, 2000 in a blink of an eye, don't seem long ago, but it's 22 years, it's a generation. And, um, and so, little by little, um, we kind of got, I got teased into doing more. And, uh, so to, in order to make something initially, we worked with one of the flock manufacturers that made for beddings, underlays and stuff like that, they're still around. Uh, and uh, because they were pals from, from way back, they uh, stopped the machine one Saturday morning and put some stuff through that I'd sorted. I'd sorted through uh, two tons of materials, two tons of post-consumer, so woolen knits. And I might as well get these out. My dilemma was, if I sorted through 2,000 kilos and made 40 or 50 shades like rag merchants had made, I'd have had 10 kilos of this and 5 kilos of that one to be worth it. So I had to break out rules and think, how do I sort a fewer number of shades, but everything has to be used up? Because back in the day, if you had what we call fancy or jazz, so think of a Christmas jumper that's green and red and reindeers and white, and look, which, which pile is that going to? Back in the day, we did that over dyed it chrome black. Um, and the lighter shades, people would strip bleach and dye a lighter colour. And that would a way around it. But we didn't want to go down that way. So I just had to make family shades. I had to make a decision that all the darks, navies, and the blacks are going here. I had to figure out, okay, the reds are all going to go in that. Apart from, if I put pastels in this, they're going to be washed out. So all pastels went in that that we call candy floss, anyone. So every pastel went in that. Um, there's only seven shades here, although it looks like there's eight. It just shows that blue, I'm looking round, I'm not surprised because there's a lot of blue, is the most popular colour. So there are twice as many blue jumpers as any others. So we just added a bit of that, and, uh, and these have got 20% of new wool in as well. So we used a naturally coloured dark wool with that to darken it. But we've got twice as much blue. And similarly, so we, we managed, there were one garment left when we'd gone through all the tooth and managed to get them into actually seven, not eight shades. But it was a, it was a kind of a, a weird experience to go through because it just didn't feel right putting pastel blue in with pastel pink and pastel green, but they all went into that one. I ended up quite nice colour, as you can see, one of my favourites. Um, so we made a range, we were able to get those um, pulled, mixed with a bit of new wool, with sins for the white wool, so all the light colours, uh, I've got white wool, these have got naturally coloured um, dark wool, all the white wool ones at the top, uh, we now use GOT certified organic British lambs wool, that's great. But these have a, they're a bit coarse, they're okay for every, every apparel. They're great for rugs, 
and stuff like that. Talking of rugs, it's one of my favourite ones. We made this for Mitsubishi when they were doing a launch, and these are their colours. And uh, we, uh, I'm pretty sure with this one, we twisted two ends together, um, so that when we were in finishing, we could give it a right good brushing with teasels and get a nice. But that's that's 35 years old. That nice nice rug that by anybody, and that were all that were 100% recycled wool. So that were 40 years ago. That were jumpers that people threw out into a, and it, it survived survived until now, hasn't it? Yeah, that's one that's just a flat finish, hats and various things. So, um, so we got this range out and realised that there were lots of other materials that we'd like to work with Mungo as well. We started talking to some of the worsted manufacturers that are still around that have got their waste, what they're going to do with it. So, yeah, well, okay, that's, there's some really good fibre in that stuff. We're talking like super fine 120s wool and if we could recover that, but I can't do it on flock manufacturers machines because number one, they put like all sorts through and there's contamination issues. You can't change your settings because they want to get on with their fingers just a favor. So um, I put a grant into uh, RAP, which is Waste Resource Action Program. That's um, a charity that um, promotes recycling for DEFRA. So never thinking we'd get it in a million years. Uh, and I also put a research and development grant into uh, BFTT, Business of Fashion, Textiles and Technology, which is through Innovate UK. And I put both these out thinking, well, if you don't buy a ticket, you don't, but not really thinking. And then it occurred to me, once we get the machine, where we're going to put it, because we're not wealthy enough people. And uh, so I went to, a, wrote to a few mills, and one mill um, said, well, if you can repurpose our waste, you can put it in, we've got a room where you can put it in. And um, this would have been in and running a year, almost a year, last June. Uh, but they ran into problems at the 11th hour with their insurance because of the fires that have happened in the, in the trade. It's, um, it's uh, kind of something that's become synonymous with textile recycling. And uh, they just wouldn't cover them. So we were left with a machine and, and, and rap saying, what are you going to do with this machine to me? Uh, and, and, and a grant for the for R&D and nowhere to put it last June. So I started running around all the trade, the people that were left, people that were in the textiles or textiles related. And they were all cheering me on, but for one reason or another, nobody could accommodate us. Uh, either they were worried about their insurance or they didn't have enough room or it was going to take too much power or whatever it was. The, we did, it looked as though we were going to run out of time. And then we approached um, Chimera Fabrics, which are, um, well, they're mostly in Huddersfield. But if you've ever been at London Underground or any at Leeds Theatres or most at trains, you sat on Chimera Fabrics uh, cloth. And um, the interesting thing about when we think about circularity and circles, they were. An earlier iteration of them called Camborne Fabrics that were based at Huddersfield, they were one of our best customers. And they were using reclaimed materials for, uh, for their fabrics, for, for transport and for, uh, for all that kind of stuff, until they couldn't get that material anymore and they couldn't get the consistency when all the shoddy manufacturers. But for a decade and a half, and I remember them starting up and coming to see us, um, and they, you know, they've gone through a few different takeovers and now they're Chimera Fabrics and the weave at the David Brown factory in Meltham, what used to be, really big building. That's where the weaving is. They've got a knitting mill in Leicester and a weaving place in Lithuania. They're a big company. We're going to be based in, we are based now, in Bay Hall Mills, which used to be Stark Brothers, for people that know old trade. That's in Birkby in Huddersfield. And uh, we're currently knocking all through walls. They're putting electricity in and doing all that. And that machine, at uh, end of this month, probably going to pick Jubilee time because Bay Hall Mills is, is kind of in a very built-up residential area and we're trying to figure out how we're going to get these heavy lumps of two, three-ton rag machine and a garnet machine. So a rag machine, will, I'll pull loose material like this and open it up well enough, but leave a bit of threading. But if you've got tightly twisted stuff, worsted spun stuff, um, or if you've just got carding engineers that are a bit nervous about putting it on their sets, their cards, 
then you'll need to get it a bit finer. So I've got a rag machine, a garlic machine there, and a press that's about five tons going into this room and a bit of space for sorting and storage inside. And that'll be the first shoddy unit coming back into Yorkshire since 2000 when Charles Day's uh, business closed. And hopefully, um, you know, we'll be able to um, help Camira recycle their stuff. We're talking to other mills in the UK because this isn't just about us making our yarns and fabrics as much as we like to do that because it's great fun. It's but the UK manufacturers haven't had that chance. And for 20, 22 years ago still, it might not have been, there might not have been that imperative in terms of how businesses are being challenged with the carbon footprint and all that kind of stuff. So um, there is a lot of interest from the remaining wool and cashmere manufacturers in the UK. And what we want to do is to take the UK's waste, both pre and post consumer, convert it back to materials that can be used um, oh, by British designers and manufacturers. Not that we're, we're, we're not anti import and export, but we kind of see that keeping things local is a good thing to do as well. And probably for our starting point, which is more of a more of a proof of concept thing, really. We'll produce about a couple of tons a week on a single shift of, um, of shoddy material. So if you're blending it 50-50 with wool, that's still a lot of yarn and fabric if you, if you were making it. So it's not inconsiderable. But we're, al we're almost building the market. I can't just phone up and say to come in with Summers at Batley and say, have you got five tons of black, Alan? Or Alfred Ward's at Osset, can I have 500 kilos of scarlet stockings? And they'd have them. It's like going to Tesco's, they'd have them there. You'd have some of them, Oliver Holidays and, and people like that at Osset, and all they sort in the surge. You know, uh, well, mustards and, and cloth. Um, so you could get all these different grades and all these different colours. We haven't got that option now, so we have to, we're going to have to build the market at the same time as we build the infrastructure to, to take it in. So it's going to be a different shoddy trade to the one that I was brought up in and the one that uh, that, that fills the history books, but a new one, and hopefully um, one that will encourage younger generations to come and learn and do it better than us, to bring in technology or whatever it is that they can, they can bring to it and learn what we know, take the best of the old and um, give it a spin and the best of the new one. I really think that there's a lot more to be gained than just one recycling unit like we're going to start with. I think, I mean, there used to be, well, I don't know about hundreds, but many, many scores of, 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 of rag pulling machines in the area. I know it was different times and different stuff, but certainly I think the market is bigger than what we've got. Um, the difficulties are things like it costs such a lot of money to set it up, such a lot of money. It's probably by the time we've done with the grants and what Camira has spent and what we put in personally and there and there, it's probably just to get that one line might cost half a million quid and we haven't started with market yet. And all other people that were well-established businesses were struggling to get insurance for it. Um, so we had to join together with Camira for them to be a majority shareholder in 51%. Me and wife still own 49 though. Um, and, and, uh, um, still directors and working with them and they've been fabulous, really supportive, but they needed that control to satisfy their insurance companies that they could manage that risk that we talked about with fire. And they've been fabulous. We've got things that we never had on. We've got metal detectors now on the front. We've got magnets in, fire suppression systems. Fabulous. Mag it's, it's, a, it's not a spark detector, it's, but it's a, a metal detector that'll stop if there's any metal on the thing. And if there's, if there's and you calibrate that to whatever spark size. Sets it does, That's, that, that was one of the things when we were investigating it. It's, it, either, it can set the sprinklers off and then there are other, other sort of, yeah, other devices that just stop your machines the whole time. So, so we've, we've been able to find a fix that satisfies the insurance companies. And it'll, um, and, and also different, different to, to whereas before, we'd be buying in from rag merchants that wanted to get materials sorted very quickly. And, and really, they didn't take zip, zips and buttons off. And they did get crushed through the machine and they just dropped down the trap. Whereas we now sort by hand our own stuff. We sort and take every 
button and zip and stuff off of uh, even talking to some people in the craft trade about maybe even buying the buttons and zips and reusing them too. Uh, yeah. If they've gone through a machine, they will be battered. Although we're missing a trick there. I've actually got some of them. I think if you got them, a, a bit of you could you could do something with them, like a top of a table or. There you go. There you go. But ours, we we actually take when we take them off, we 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 uh, sacrifice a bit of the strip of the knitted, and so it's a set of buttons. So if somebody wanted it as a set, they're not going through a great bag of buttons too. So we we're hoping to encourage the craft trade to have the opportunity, zips and buttons, and for them it'll be cheap. For us, we'll just recover a bit of that money we've lost on on the on the materials, and those will be good. And you find some really like really old ones, like wooden toggles and. And, and all sorts of stuff. Um, watches, take all 20 pound notes out of pocket now. You don't find many. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a really useful thing to be able to do that as well as we're experimenting with non-woven applications now where we, where we might needle post-consumer wool for, for, um, for fillings. And people are starting to look at other things that are not an apparel usage so insulation um things that might uh, be acoustics so for the, using the properties of the wool padding in jackets and, and all that kind of stuff so um there are there you know there's a lot more that can be done and and the, the industry um i believe can not develop to where it was before but i really think it can it can start to do something else and all the something different, something more modern. And I think that eventually, perhaps even different feedstocks. It's the easy fix for us because we know wool, it's inherently fire retardant. It makes economic sense because, whereas back in the day, the raw material costs were a bigger ratio than the processing costs because people weren't being paid that much and health and safety weren't what it is. Now, it isn't so much that. It, it's more um, the processing costs than it is the raw material. So it probably costs me as much if I made hundred, if I made a hundred percent acrylic yarn from recycled. It probably cost me the same in processing costs as hundred percent wool one. But what I can get for one and what I can get for other is a big difference. So when you're trying to make a new market, you're just making it harder for yourself. Which and when you go to cashmere and recycling that, that's that's even better because you've got. A, a more expensive fiber. Um, but I do think that different feedstocks, the cottons and polyesters and other stuff, there'll be a there'll be something something for that then. And certainly when uh, even in the late 80s <coughs> we were experimenting with um cut very um poor grade material and bonding that with the resin for like concrete shuttling and stuff like that. I think they're doing that in Scandinavia now, but we were looking at there's there's other things apart from clothing that um that we can uh we can use that for so uh onward and upward you know we're uh, we hope that we can prove that we are shoddy manufacturers and not shoddy manufacturers uh and uh i asked emma to give me a nod when there was 10 minutes left for questions so um are there any questions uh, what i'd like to say is i admire the, the and there's other big names out there that are all in the industry and the multi million pound concern. They are, and there were... Do you feel any threat from them? Um, because I admire you saying that it's doing into these areas. Yeah. You're, you're in a tough area when it comes to multi million pound companies because if you've got it going and you start making enough sufficient money, I have no doubt that they'll come not to buy you out. Yeah, and I kind of thought about that, and it's a valid question. It's a massive industry. I think if I was 30 years younger, yeah. when I was starting Evergreen, I'd be doing it differently and thinking differently. Um, but I'm not. I'm towards the end of my career. I have chance of doing something really special. And personally, and maybe selfishly, that probably ain't going to no, happen to me. Enthusiasm. And don't get me wrong, I am trying to be mean. No. 
world today runs on money. Yeah, yeah. The people that are already established with any sort of business will take over this the whole time, isn't it? And they're closing competition down. Yeah. It's very, very hard in today's carry ons to make any sort of business and be profitable. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of a, a world where I'm not particularly skilled as a businessman. But Chimera are a very successful business, and certainly what we've brought to them or repurposed their waste, probably um, their waste alone, if, if we, we've come to a deal where we can do our thing with the apparel and clothing and half their thing for its, its status, um, that, that machine that's going in there would do that for them, which is a good enough thing in itself. And if people can learn from it and become educated, and there'll always be competition, and if they, you know, it's not, they were around when the shoddy trade were around and they didn't, but, but the, 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 the demand is different now, but it is a different skill set, making yarns and fabrics. They, cottons would have the wherewithal to do pretty much whatever they wanted. Um, but I do think there'll be plenty of room for lots of people. And for me, four years, I'm state retirement age. Sorry. So Mungo are fibres from woven material. So Mungo's fibres from woven material. Correct. It's like shredded rag jeans. That's it's shredded woven. So it's not rag. looking to do with this uh, fibre afterwards that's torn shoddy. It's actually the fibre itself. Mm, it's a trick. That's it. It's a bit of both. So you, Yeah, yeah, rayon, which is a viscous yeah, substitute. So, yeah. Well, so for <coughs> those, yeah, back in the day, so when when Benjamin Power was trying to do his mongrel thing, that were mostly wool. And um, so you would probably have your machine set differently. You would run your swift, big drum with teeth on, quicker. Um, you might run your feed rollers a little bit slower. You might have your, your swift pinned different the nails that are on there so you might have different settings and then what you did with the mongo might be a bit different as well because it were much shorter but quite soft you might have a different application for that so for example uh, a byproduct of the worsted spinning system is to create noils which are also very short fibers if you're making a melting fabric where you don't want your weave to show often they put noils in with a lot of good wool so when your fabric went through finishing, they'd mill it and it'd burst and fill in the spaces so it looked like pool tablecloth. So you would use it for specific things, the mungo, things like that. Whereas the um, shoddy, which were pulled from knitted garments, would be perhaps a little bit more flexible. You'd have a little bit more differences in the uses for that. That's her. Sorry. Um, so I understood this, the laws, the problem was that they didn't protect themselves with patent hanging around. Um, do you have any aspect of what you're doing now which you can protect yourself? Uh, so, well, I knew the name. By the way, I knew it was a strange name, and it so many, so, <laughs> so many vowels and only one consonant, I think. So, um, it, but it, it, um, it's not an accident, um, although it felt like it at the time. Um, I was trying to think about how can I just capture in one word what it meant to be coming back into trade because we never thought we'd be able to come back into trade. Also to try and capture the idea about what we call waste, but it's not, it's a raw material just limited by our imagination or my imagination or people in the trade or whatever and they've done they do some wonderful things with it. So how do I kind of get that? And I'm always telling kids, look, it's not necessarily how clever you are, often it's tenacity. You know, don't give up. And in the Yorkshire dialect, it's never over until it's over. So I put that into company's house with the contracted it's on both sides, but amazingly, somebody got something close. So I had to go into the long form. It is never over until it is over. That's how I remember to spell it. It's been three years, and I still how I remember to spell it. So that's where, where the name of New York comes from. And it, I know the marketing people say, well, some of them, not all of them, say it's, uh, it, 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 you know, it's a bit clumsy or you don't tell what you do. It's a great conversations piece. Always has a chance to tell a tale. And they say, well, it doesn't say what you do. Well, like Apple, Boohoo, B next, B&Q, yeah? <laughs> you know? 
Yeah. Sure. Uh, Are you saying it's something that I would imagine you cannot put a painting on? Well, it be because uh, it's all different blends of different things, and everybody's making the same thing. Yeah, it's not a patent; it's a trademark. It's a, yeah. And yeah. You cannot patent it, so it's so so simple an idea putting it bluntly. Yeah. That that's why it was never patented because it would have been patented. Yeah. The, the people that first developed it would have been head in the industry, one of would have been a big name, but there's that many happy. Ah, you mean the, the, the shoddy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, the name, the, the flower and the name is, is, a, is a trademark, yeah. and we're just rebranding it with Chimera now to make it, which is great because I had it tattooed on my arm, and then it's going to change it. Yeah. <laughs> like you all said, you've got cash, cashmere fillings, you've got wool fillings. Uh, John Cotton's, I don't know if they still do it, but when I worked at trade, there were spinning bottles, like you said. Yeah. They were making that polypropane, which gives them to like quilts. That's it. Which is into fillings for them. Yeah, I think they still do. Yeah. Sorry to say you. Did, you, did I understand you to say you were only recycling pure wool? Uh, most, as, as pure as we can get. I mean, clearly, when, we, when we're working with post consumer wool knitwear, there's sewing threads in. And there'll be cotton and synthetic sewing threads, and we don't deseam them. How do you get rid of the synthetics if there's synthetics in it? We've, the way that we've worked at the moment is to work with some really good charities that sort really well, and uh, also some companies on their tape back schemes. So, mostly online retailers that sell wool, merino jumpers that have said to the customers, if you send them back, we'll give you a voucher, whatever. Ten bob so You're not attempting to process the ones that have got synthetics. No, I've oh yeah. Well, we label sort, so it says hundred percent wool on the label. Yeah. As much as you know, it can say hundred percent wool on 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 a label. It can say, you know, made in England, but it will label that we're made in England, not garment, all that stuff, you know. But but we do get some that are like eighty twenty. Or even 70 30, and back in the day, the rag merchants would have said that were okay with the 100% wools because you'd end up with like a 90 90%. We've put them to one side because we're not sure what we want to do with them yet. So we've got half a ton of sort of 80 20, 70 30s. We didn't want to spoil our high wool content, but somewhere online we'll figure out what to do with them. I don't know if you've come across this, but I read. And I don't know where it is, but somewhere on the internet, somebody in Osset worked in a counter uh, family shoddy business. And they were describing a process where um, cloth that had a mixture of wool and other fibers in it, they were, they were hanging them in cages over vats of concentrated acid, and the acid fumes were dissolved. Yeah, yeah. It's called carbonizing. Yeah, because yeah. it's yeah. petroleum based, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They said they were also dissolving half the <coughs> curtains in Ossipa as well. Yeah, I remember when we used to, because a lot of a lot of army uniforms had all the capulets and stuff on loads of cotton. Yeah, they used a lot of <coughs> army uniforms in Mongolia because you've got a waste afterwards. Correct. It was dumped in Britain from other countries as a useless substance. It was. Lots of it were used. We were ticked and buried, but then because of Mongol and being able to shred it up, that's why. Yeah, and they introduced this carbonizing process that would dissolve the cotton or anything that's cellulosic. It did weaken the wool, but not not so much as um, to mean that it wasn't worthwhile. But they were supposed to wash it off after. It's a bit of a nasty process. We don't. In Prato, they carbonize in, in Italy. They're really good at what they do, but and then they pull it underwater. So it's pulled underwater. It's not done like we do it in, in Yorkshire. Um, and um, you did wonder what it was doing to the workers' lungs. Oh, it was bad stuff. <laughs> well, and then when the bales used to come, often the bale them in uh, polypropylene bales, yeah. but if they used jute string, if they were in warehouse for like longer than six months, mm -hmm. if you dropped a, a bale out, of, you know, um, but you can see why rip, what they call, used to call ripping surge, cleaning stockings and ripping surge. And if you'd have been uh, ripping that, it would have. You'd have been a lot of waste, there'd been a lot of man time. It was in life yeah. as well. Women did that. Though, yeah. Well, like, tradi traditionally, that was a typical thing. It's strange how, how it was, but most mostly it was seen as a. Because my shells at the other end of the marketplace, they started yeah. in 1856. Oh, yeah, yeah. And that mill is probably one of the oldest buildings in 
Yeah, yeah still got it. Yeah. yeah. Other than they used to do it over at Riddle. So old dust used to drop off. So like it. They took the buttons off on a wire grid, didn't they? Yeah, they, they did. They used to work in a place called Zimmerman's in Bath. I know them, yeah. Yeah. And they all ended up with arthritis in the Aye. Because they were rubbing the buttons off. Yeah, yeah. Of cardigans and clothes and shirts. And yeah. Know what I mean. Yeah, more recently, I mean, they've been around a long time, but we've got a, um, a, 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 a rag cutter, you know, it's a circular knife and it, it's easier to take it off and you, you don't. It looks like shears, doesn't it? We, we, we have shears as well, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And shears, the light sharp and the steel. Yeah, they're just like sheep, sheep shears. Yeah. Yeah. They were very similar. Yeah, and hand hooks. You wanted your own, because to get old at Bales, you wanted your own hand hook, because it like moulded, it felt like it moulded <laughs> to your hand. And it, you were always really protective of your your, your own hand hook. Yeah, you had your favourite cart and all that. All that. Yeah, there were certain size were a botany bale and a shoddy square and uh, the fact that bales were rags, they used to thread in it, it was called bale threading. It was and when it put tied up after the mill and the study. Yeah, yeah. You'll see that if you look on our website. Our, I know T W when I when I was ten. And it's still metal in a fellow. Because uh, uh, we are in this side of Yorkshire, it's known as Bed City. Yeah, I can imagine. There's that many bedding companies in this area. That's yeah. A rule always was when you tread it bale, tread, tread corners in the middle will look after itself. And you've got a nice square bale then. We had a good bottom on it that stood up instead of falling over. Are we up, are we up to. We are, yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for listening. Yeah.